people in the power industry to understand the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. So we'd like to welcome you, and we have two great sessions, one today and one tomorrow, with experts from EPRI, Stanford, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Google, and Southern California Edison. So this is a really great panel that we have, and we're looking forward to um, having all of you here. So to start this meeting, we do have a short safety message, and so I'll get into that once we share the presentation that we have. Um, and it's really about tornado safety. So we're getting into the time of year when we're starting to have some severe weather events in different parts of the country and around the world. So the safety message that we have for you today is really centered around understanding um, how to stay safe, and that's understanding the difference between a tornado watch as well as a tornado warning. So a watch is just that, that the conditions are favorable for the formation of tornadoes, whereas a warning is just like it sounds like, much more severe that there is a tornado that has been spotted or radar indicated, and that it is advisable to take shelter immediately. So there are many other items that you can look at. You can see here, the, from, this is from the FEMA website. You can also go to the NOAA website or other local weather stations that you have for more information. So please do stay safe out there. Next, we'd like to go and talk about how you can make the most of this meeting. So we are recording this session. The materials will be available afterwards on ai.epri.com. There will be a link to the recorded materials from all the speakers to be able to get engaged during this meeting. We do encourage you to use the Q&A feature. You can see here how to use that. I think most people are familiar. So as you ask questions, we will take those, compile them, and ask them in the final panel that we have at the end of each day. We will not have um, specific speakers during their presentations answer those. And make sure to send questions to all panelists, so that way we'll be able to get those, see those, and respond to them. Um, next up, we have our series of meetings for this year. As you, as you can see here, we are in the meeting on the far left. This is actually our second in a series of four meetings for 2021. You can see the remainder of the meetings for the rest of this year that we have planned. So we encourage you to mark those on your calendars and make sure to attend. We, we have a great group of people that will be in each of these meetings. So that's it for the meeting introduction. I'll now turn the time over to our meeting host, Makun Koshik from Southern California Edison to cover the agenda and the official welcome from Southern California Edison. Makun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, I welcome everybody to this uh, training session. Uh, my name is Mukund Kaushik, and I lead the digital accelerator here at uh, Southern California Edison in Los Angeles. Uh, the role of our group here in, uh, uh, for the, in the digital accelerator is to basically use uh, uh, AI, machine learning, and some of the robotic process automation capabilities to help prevent the risk of wildfire, improve operational efficiency, and also provide better customer service. And so I'm really excited to be uh, uh, the uh, hosting this uh, particular event. And first of all, let me begin by congratulating all of you on taking the initiative to begin your learning journey in this very important topic. Uh, this field of uh, AI and machine learning, as you will see, is uh, constantly changing uh, with brand new advances happening uh, almost uh, every month. Uh, so it's never too late to it's never too late to begin. And I'm glad that you're all uh, taking this uh, very important step uh, on this learning journey. Uh, I'm also thankful to EPRI. Uh, there's a over there's a lot of content that's out there in this space, and what EPRI has done is they have curated uh, the content uh, that is available in this space, and they have set up uh, uh, this learning. Not only this learning, but they're also setting up other courses uh, to help leaders understand how to leverage AI, how to leverage machine learning uh, within the electric and power utility space. Uh, but also they have some deep technical sessions for uh, people who want to learn more uh, in this space. And once you get this learning started, then you can begin or you can chart your own journey in terms of uh, where you want to take uh, your learning journey. Uh, so in terms of uh, the agenda today, uh, we have a packed three hour session where we will talk a little bit about uh, what is AI. Uh, we'll introduce you to some of the new concepts, uh, some of the new AI techniques like machine learning and image recognition and try and explain to you what those are so that you have a better understanding of that. 
Uh, we'll talk about the importance of data and AI because without data, there is no AI. So we'll, uh, they will, uh, uh, Christian Lee from April will talk about the importance of data and AI and, and the importance of the metadata that's associated with the, AI, with the data. Uh, explainability is a huge uh, concept uh, in the AI community, and uh, we will talk a little bit more about what that means and how do you help remove biases uh, from the algorithms that uh, we could potentially introduce as we develop our models. And we'll then we'll wrap up with some use cases uh, for the utility for the power sector, as well as uh, there'll be a panel dis dis discussion around the introduction to some of the AI and machine learning concepts where you, may, you can ask some questions also to the panelists. Uh, so again, I'd like to welcome again everybody to this uh, three hours uh, to the first day of the three hour session. There's another session tomorrow. And, uh, and I want to thank all the speakers in advance for preparing and delivering a presentation. And with that, uh, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Shibon, uh, who's from Stanford, and she'll talk to you about what is AI. Over to you. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, today, I'll be presenting an introduction to AI. What is it? What are the key concepts? And what can it do? So we'll look through some notable successes and different ways AI can be used in energy and cover some of its limitations as well. I want to say that many of the topics I introduced will be covered in great detail later today and tomorrow, so you should view this presentation in some ways as a teaser for the rest of the workshop. So before I dive in, let me briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm now a fifth year PhD student at Stanford. My advisor, Professor Roger Gopal, will be speaking to you tomorrow. Our group studies the grid and its interaction with different distributed energy resources, and my own research focus is on electric vehicles and how we can prepare to support widespread EV charging. We're part of a large group of researchers at Stanford and Slack in this area, and I'd like to thank all our wonderful collaborators, some of whom are listed here. So what is AI? This is often a hot topic of discussion among researchers, and I see many different definitions. Using a word cloud to compile some of those top definitions, a few themes jump out, the computer and human. I would say that AI is a branch of computer science that involves teaching computer systems to mimic human intelligence in problem solving and perception. AI is very broad and always changing, and by definition, it includes things that haven't been done yet and tools that have yet to be developed. Most of the tools that we'll discuss in this workshop, though, actually fall under a subcategory of AI called machine learning. Definitions for machine learning focus more on data, learning, making predictions, and decisions. I like to think of machine learning as a toolbox of approaches and algorithms that use data to solve interesting problems. And that's where this workshop will focus. We won't be discussing AI in the context of general intelligence, so no, robot, no robots that think and act like humans, but rather we'll discuss how AI and tools for machine learning can be used to solve other exciting and important problems in energy. So the tools in the toolbox of machine learning can be divided into several categories. The first I'll briefly introduce is called unsupervised learning, and that looks at a single data set. This set of approaches tries to find insights and patterns within the data, for example, by clustering the data into different groups. The second main category of tools called supervised learning is a second data set. Um, you could think of this as outputs or labels for the input data samples. And this set of approaches tries to learn the mapping from X to Y. So for example, if the input data includes individual households, then the output label might describe whether that household has installed rooftop solar. Or in another example, weather data could be the input and the output could be expected production at a wind farm site. The third large category is a little bit different and generally involves problems where an agent is interacting with an environment um, here, the agent or algorithm tries to find the optimal policy of actions to maximize its reward. This is called reinforcement learning. And a typical example might be a robot moving through a maze or an algorithm playing a video game. The session will go into, the following sessions will go into much more detail on each of these approaches, but this should help introduce some of what I think are the key concepts to understand the potential of machine learning. First, just from these three categories, we can understand that there's a wide range of tools and applications. I'm sure you're already thinking of many of your own ideas or examples in each of these categories. Um, and second, I think it's important to introduce that across this wide range of tools, there's a common framework for analysis. So 
The performance of these algorithms can be clearly quantified using error metrics and performance on testing sets. Each application involves model selection, which is choosing the best tool for the problem and tuning its parameters in a rigorous and structured way. Um, and critically, each of these approaches depends on data. As more and more data is becoming available across different energy applications, that's creating a great opportunity to use AI and ML. You're probably already familiar with many examples of AI in action. One of its most famous successes was AlphaGo. So Go is a famously complicated board game invented in China thousands of years ago. There are 10 to the 170 board configurations that's so far more complex than chess. And the AlphaGo AI player created by DeepMind, which is now part of Google, uses a type of reinforcement learning on the problem to learn to play the game. This is a snapshot from one of its tournament matches. And in 2017, AlphaGo beats the human world number one player. Another example is the digital assistant that you have in your phone or computer or in your smart home device. Alexa, Siri, the Google Assistant, these all use natural language processing to interpret your speech and use AI to formulate responses to your questions and commands. There are also many applications in energy and electricity. Just take a look at recent papers in any of the top energy journals and you'll see machine learning, data driven, here are some snapshots from a few recent publications in Nature Energy as an example. So let's dive into those applications a bit more. How can AI be used? One major application is in image processing. So here's an example um, from a project called Deep Solar that used deep learning to identify solar panels from Google Earth images. On the left, you can see how the algorithm processed images to identify the panels. And on the right, an illustration of the database that the project created showing the density of panels all throughout the US just from these images. Another type of application is in automating responses. This is often implemented with different types of reinforcement learning. So this may be optimizing operation of grid resources, for example, using local battery storage to buffer against spikes in a site's load or managing a resource's bidding into an energy market. This could also apply to grid resilience events, so operating distributed resources to implement virtual islanding in the event of a grid outage. Another application is in prediction and forecasting. So you can think of many useful applications, forecasting a building's energy consumption, the site's renewable generation, the arrival of vehicles at a charging station, the likelihood of extreme events. Here is an example from a project in our group that looks at forecasting load for individual appliances in a household. So on the left, you can see this is the power demand of a small refrigerator over the course of one day. And on the right, a graphical representation of the model that the authors used to predict the next step in the time series, the parameters for which were all fit directly from the data. Another type of application is in identifying errors or anomalies. There are many tools in the machine learning toolbox that can be applied to this problem of labeling data points that are outliers or look different than expected or are suspicious. ML tools can also be used to identify patterns and clusters in data. This is one of my personal favorite methods. Um, one application from a paper we have under review right now looked at the change in electricity demand caused by COVID-19 lockdowns and restrictions. Um, here on the left is an example uh, using the US, a snapshot from a paper showing the change in the electricity demand through the months of May 2020 and clustering the different responses for these regions and 53 countries around the world, we identified four different response patterns. Um, here on the right are the four clusters that were identified, countries and places with extreme or severe or moderate or mild response shapes and patterns. Um, another example from my own work looks at electric vehicle charging, um, clustering electric vehicle drivers based on their charging histories. This figure shows the load profile for each of five different clusters of drivers identified by the algorithm, each using a mixture of residential charging, workplace charging, public charging, um, highlighting the distinct patterns of charging behavior that exists in the data set. Another application, and the final one that I'll list here, is in improved modeling. So this is an important, this can be important in cases where 
traditional model parameters are unavailable or measurements are missing or for some applications where solving the traditional physics-based model equations uh, is very computationally expensive. So here is an example from work in our group that use machine learning methods for modeling distribution networks. The powerful equations on the left describe the relationship between power and voltage in the network, and these highlighted parameters, G and B, represent characteristics of the network. The approach in the paper directly estimates those parameters from the data from measurements taken at different nodes in the network rather than relying on physical models of the line. So this is just a snapshot of the many types of machine learning and the many applications in energy, certainly not an exhaustive list. And you'll go into more detail on some of these throughout the rest of the workshop, but hopefully this gives a good introduction of what, what's out there. And finally, I want to include a warning about some of the challenges and dangers that can also come with using AI and machine learning. Some of the algorithms can be brittle and easily hacked. So in this example on the left, images were altered or created to trick an image processing algorithm. As humans, we can easily look at these images and say, you know, this is a stop sign or that's not a starfish, but to the algorithm, they look very similar. The data sets used and the engineers creating the algorithms can also introduce their own biases. On the top right here is a snapshot from a study that compared the accuracy of commercial facial recognition software on people of different genders and races. Um, the authors found a large discrepancy across the different software, up to 34% difference in accuracy in the performance on identifying lighter men and darker women. And AI can also be used for dangerous applications. So this is a clip from a video shown in one of MIT's intro courses to AI. President Obama did not actually read the course syllabus and do the introduction for the class, but this deep fake version of him doing it was very convincing. This isn't to say that AI or ML in general are dangerous. They're just tools, and like any tool, how and where they're applied is important. So I want to conclude that AI and machine learning are powerful modeling tools that with good data and careful application can have great positive impacts on many interesting problems. They're not a magic bullet and can't be applied blindly, but there are tools or many tools in the toolbox. Um, I hope that this sample of energy applications has piqued your interest for the rest of the workshop. The team at EPRI has put together a great lineup of speakers for you. I've included some information here about courses offered through Stanford if you want to continue your learning to a deeper dive afterwards. And yeah, so thank you so much for inviting me to speak and to all of you for listening and welcome to AI. All right, I uh, hope you guys can hear me well. Uh, thanks, Sean. That was, that was really, really wonderful. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Pratik Kulkarni and uh, I work as a data scientist for the Transmission and Distribution Infrastructure um, Department here at EPRI. Today I will be talking about the uh, widely reused, widely implemented AI techniques uh, in general, you know, shedding some more light on the ML trifecta that's supervised, unsupervised, and uh, reinforcement learning. I'm sorry. And then eventually I'll be di uh, digging deeper into image recognition uh, and what are the different techniques that are being employed in the industry, different technique workflows that you can adopt yourself uh, for your own um, applications, for your own projects. And then uh, I'll be also talking about some of the utility applications. So really, uh, AI or artificial intelligence is, is the umbrella term that uh, all of us uh, all of us hear uh, all the time. I'm, I'm, I'll help you guys kind of demystify different terms um, as, as it relates to uh, AI. To define AI, really, AI is a system that is capable of making some smart decisions based on conditions. Now, this does not necessarily mean that any AI system would have a learning, a learning concept associated to it. It even might be a deterministic algorithm that has been smartly built and can uh, work well in an environment. On the other side, Data science is an interdisciplinary field about scientific methods, processes, and systems to extract knowledge or insights from the data in various forms. Now, what, what this really means is with the data that you, you've got, with, with all the pre-processing, with all the data factoring and data um, analysis that you do, you can drive decisions out of this data. This is what 
data science really means. Machine learning, on the other hand, is again a subset of, of the bigger umbrella term, artificial intelligence. It is a concept of building a, building a model that is capable of learning from data to make some unseen decisions, on, uh, so to make, make decisions on unseen data. Now, this is really a, a, a process where you build a function or write a function that learns certain patterns in the data and then predicts on unseen data. On the, other, on the other hand, deep learning is even a smaller subset of machine learning that deals with um, even complex forms of data, uh, data like images, speech, text. Uh, it's really important to understand the key differences between machine learning and deep learning and how you can go about your own applications before, uh, uh, how, how you can go about building your own applications. Uh, in machine learning, you, you, you generally tend to craft your own features. What this really means is in the data sets that you have, you have to analyze the features, you have to find the relevant features, find the irrelevant features, try to find the correlation between them, and once you have got the perfectly factored data set, you can then build algorithms on top of that. While in contrast to deep learning, deep learning is an end-to-end -end process, which involves getting an input. Um, you configure the model, you configure the black box, and then you get an output. Machine learning is characterized by gradient descent, uh, which, which enables the learning aspect, while in deep learning, it's backpropagation that enables the learning aspect. Generally, machine learning algorithms are faster to train as compared to deep learning algorithms, and that's because Deep learning algorithms tend to deal with heavier, um, heavier data formats like images, speech, and also heavier computations. That's why you, you, you must have heard the term uh, using GPUs to train deep learning algorithms. Some, some key um, algorithms in machine learning are support vector machine, random forest, um, k-nearest neighbors that are used, to, used for classification, and linear regression for regression, which I'll be getting into more detail now soon. Well, deep learning, in, in deep learning, you've got convolution neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about supervised learning. Supervised learning is the machine learning task of learning a function that maps an input to an output based on example input-output pairs. Um, what, what this really means is you've got a data set, and for every data point or, or for every data row, you've got a target label. Um, for instance, if I have to build a build a machine learning model that, that distinguishes between a broken insulator class and a flashed insulator class, I would have every image or every data point in my data set labeled as either broken or flashed. This would be fed to a machine learning model like, like a support vector machine or, or, or any classification model that would learn the differences between these two classes and then predict, uh, predict a class for an unseen data. This is the classical example of classification, while the other type of supervised learning is regression. It is used to predict continuous values. The best example would be to predict the price of a house uh, based on certain features. The advantage of using the supervised learning technique is that you have prior knowledge of the classes in your data set. You can safely discard the data and store, just store the learned function that can be easily applied to the unseen data. The disadvantages, it's not real time. It's really sensitive to noisy and incorrectly labeled data. So you've got to make sure that your data set is perfectly labeled uh, to avoid any sorts of uh, unseen issues and biases. The other type of learning is unsupervised learning, which is a type of algorithm that learns patterns from unlabeled data. The machine is forced to learn and build a compact internal representation from the data it is exposed to. The key difference between unsupervised learning and unsupervised learning is that in unsupervised learning, your data point or your data row does not have a target label. Uh, so th that's, why, that's why you need to build an algorithm that can find the similarities or the internal patterns in the data and then try to uh, give a distinction. Two types of uh, unsupervised learning algorithms that are commonly used are clustering and association. Clustering involves grouping data points according to their similarities, while association involves discovering relationships between the attributes of these data points. The advantage of using unsupervised learning technique is that it can work in real time. So as your data comes in, you can, at, 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 in real time, you can try to, you, you can churn the data um, out and build uh, uh, different sort of algorithms. The disadvantage is that it is comparatively less accurate to uh, supervised learning, and it's really difficult to confirm your results because you don't have a target label. The third pillar in this ML trifecta is the reinforcement learning. It is an area of machine learning concerned with how intelligent agents ought to take actions in an environment. 
in order to maximize the notion of cumulative reward. What this really means is there's an agent or an AI, or let's say robot, for instance, that sits in an environment. It has the ability to perceive the state which, uh, in which it is in, and depending on this state, it, it can generate an action. This action or also the output is rewarded with a positive or a negative uh, feedback or reward. And based on that, it moves to another state. This is a sequential process and also an iterated process. Uh, as Shawan already mentioned, uh, AlphaGo is, is one of the uh, key or notable successes uh, in, in reinforcement learning. Now, this is a quick techniques recap of what we just discussed, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. And then there are some other approaches like semi-supervised learning, active learning, uh, which are a bit more advanced. Now, moving on to the next next subtopic, image recognition. What, what is really image recognition? Image recognition or analysis is the process of getting a digital digital image and then processing it to get some decisions or output. Our eyes are used to perceive the visual data around us. Similarly, a sensor in a camera does the same thing. While our brain processes these uh, we, uh, image frames, similarly, a processor processes the image frames. Now, in general, image processing techniques are widely divided into two main uh, domains, uh, two, main, uh, two main techniques, traditional techniques and the modern techniques. The traditional techniques have been uh, in, in, in place since, since many decades. It involves you know, detecting edges, trying to match templates, thresholding, control detection, so on and so forth. While the modern techniques are heavily characterized by deep learning, uh, particularly like convolutional neural network, generative adversarial neural networks, autoencoders, and then recurrent neural networks. Now, image recognition, again, is, is, is all about pattern recognition. You need to build an algorithm that can detect patterns in the images that are present. Every image is characterized by a pixel, and pixel has got a pixel value associated to it. Now, how do you really find an edge, right? Edge, would, edge is essentially characterized by a sudden spike in the pixel values. So that's what, that's how, what an edge means to the computer uh, underlying. Similarly, for a shape, certain spikes of pixel values in certain locations is characterized um, uh, by a shape. Similarly, for a noise, uh, maybe it, it's more or less like an outlier, having a, having a single spike in, in, a, in, in different pixel values. Now, if you really stack these different techniques together, that's when you get your ultimate application built. Detect the contours, try to map it to different pixels, and that's how you can uh, get the size of the objects in, uh, in, in an image. Or if you want to build a scanner, a document scanner, maybe you know, just uh, write an algorithm that can detect edges, make some transformations, and then that, there's, there's, there's how you get a scanner. Now, it's really important to understand the technique workflows for traditional and machine learning based uh, techniques. Traditional, based, traditional techniques mostly involve deterministic uh, sort of algorithms where you handcraft the features, uh, as I mentioned before, and then try to build algorithms on top of that. An input, which is generally an RGB image, a uh, red, uh, red, green, blue channel image, that is fed to the, uh, the pre-processing algorithm. In this, in this part, you basically feature, you basically get the features out of the image, like edges, shapes, so on and so forth. These features are then passed to a deterministic algorithm, and the algorithm then smartly manipulates or use, makes use of these features to give you, give you a same output. On the other hand, machine learning and deep learning based techniques are mostly end to end. What this means is you have an input, again, an RGB image, which is generally resized depending on the kind of network that is being employed in the in the technique and then the the model that is configured by the programmer uh, is responsible to uh, do the learning uh, learning aspect for, for the machine learning and then you get the output so these are some of the applications in the utility space that uh, that epri has, uh, uh, has has tried to uh, uh, get into uh, one of these is automated analog gauge reader, which is a perfect example of using some traditional image processing along with unsupervised clustering uh, to, to get the readings of, of gauges. Then the second application here uh, you see on the screen is insulator defect detection, uh, which is, again, a perfect, uh, perfect example of deep learning-based solution, which involves object detection. While the third application, which we are 
uh, actively uh, uh, actively interested in is PII or personally identifiable information removal, which can be done using facial recognition and uh, optical character uh, optical character recognition. Um, so that's it. That's it from my side. If you've got any questions, feel free to uh, submit those questions at pikulkanyatapri.com. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that presentation, Pratik. Um, I'm Yashwant, and I'm a senior technical leader at EPRI. And now that you've seen what IRIS are capable of um, seeing for a machine learning algorithm, we're going to talk about speech and listening skills for a, more, uh, for a machine, um, more specifically in natural language processing. So language is something that we humans invented, right? Right from scratch, there's no rule bound by physics or chemistry that limits us to, uh, to languages. So how do we go about teaching language to a machine learning model that knows nothing about English, French, Japanese? Let's take a look. So natural language processing is part of the whole AI paradigm. It kind of falls in a lot of different places. It can be used as a simple machine learning tool uh, it can be used as a deep learning application. Um, just for the simplicity sake of this presentation, since this, this is just going to be the intro to AI, I'm going to keep it really high level and talk about a really simple use case. Um, if you like what you're hearing and seeing about natural language processing, do check out day two that's coming up tomorrow for um, This is AI, where we're going to talk about more advanced use cases. All right, so um, just to give you a gist of NLP, um, here are three different uh, groups talking about three different levels of NLP. Uh, the one on the uh, leftmost block, tokenization stemming, part of speech tagging, is a very basic block of NLP. Tokenization is splitting sentences into words. Um, stemming is making 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 the word making into make, so making the root form of it. Um, the second block, marked in yellow, is a slightly more advanced use of NLP. Uh, we're going to take a look at named entity recognition, sentiment analysis, text similar similarity. Um, we're not going to touch up on the yellow block and the red block for this meeting, but uh, NLP is also capable of question answering systems, natural language generation, and machine translation. More of these applications will be discussed tomorrow for day two. Um, so we at EPRI have uh, done uh, considerable research on different applications of NLP um, and how it can be used for detecting anomalies, um, detecting different type of events over uh, the plant timeline, a nuclear power plant's timeline. For example, has a power plant been having a lot of uh, really safety related events over its course of uh, its functioning? Um, has it had a lot of issues with radioactive waste disposal systems? So NLP makes all of this possible by parsing in hundreds and thousands or probably millions of maintenance reports and giving a summary or understand the context of a report. So since we're just going to talk about a simple use case of NLP here, um, I'm going to give you an example of a simple classification problem. Um, just like uh, Shoban and Pratik have discussed, um, classification is a supervised learning problem. We have labeled data for, um, for the entire data set. For example, if there's an event that's related to a radioactive event, then it's going to be labeled as a radioactive event. As you can see here, um, there's there's a hierarchical distribution of different different events, and they're all classified into um, different types of events. For example, power failure, general maintenance, spills and leaks that have resulted in contamination, spills and leaks that have not resulted in contamination, but in fact, a huge groundwater contamination uh, issues, so on. So all of these labels are preset, predefined by humans. 
so that we can transfer the same knowledge into the model. So this is similar to topic modeling, which is probably uh, what many of you might have observed um, in uh, NL, uh, AI blogs or articles that talk about you know, where you have a collection of articles and there is an algorithm that classifies these different articles into different subcategories like self-driving cars, virtual reality, baseball, so on and so forth. Um, so we're doing more or less the same thing here, except it's only going to be in the nuclear uh, industry space. So I'm going to walk you through a simple pipeline about how this gets done, um, because a machine only sees zeros and ones, right? How does it see words? Um, so for this example, we're going to talk about classification. Um, and a really important note here is classification deals with labeled data. We're going to have all the labels. Uh, for example, we're going to have a report, and that report is going to be uh, labeled as uh, a rad waste um, uh, event. For example, it has re resulted in a radioactive uh, incident. So um, three simple steps. We're going to remove the stop words. We're going to build something called the TFIDF. Uh, more on this later. And then we're going to train the model with the classification algorithm. So first step, and probably the most important step, um, is deciding how are we going to define a stop word, right? Stop word is basically what the word says. It's a word that needs to be ignored. Uh, it adds no value uh, to, to the sentence. In this example here, you can see um, there is a tree near the river. That sentence can kind of be compressed down to tree near river without losing a lot of information, right? Um, the way we process language is different from the way machines do it because machines are more robust to changes, uh, but we care more about grammar, but machines don't really care about grammar. So it's really important to decide stop words, but stop words can get really tricky real fast. Here's one of the example where stop words um, are kind of different. For example, a plant in the general sense of the English language would be uh, a flora or a biological uh, entity that's capable of taking in oxygen, giving out carbon dioxide, growing, giving fruits and all that. But a plant in a maintenance report in the nuclear industry is just um, talking about a nuclear power plant, which we already know, right? M the maintenance report came from the nuclear power plant itself. So the word plant does not actually add any information to the model. So we choose to ignore it, and that's a really good stop word. Uh, but this is a stop word only in our use case, um, not in a general use case, only in the uh, nuclear industry use case. So TFIDF, which is which stands for Term Frequency, Inverse Document Frequency, I know it's kind of a mouthful, but um, in simple terms, it deals with scoring a word based on the number of times it um, appears in a particular document uh, or a particular report. So if a word appears a lot of times in a single report and it doesn't appear anywhere else in the entire collection of reports, then probably that's a really important event, right? Or an event that, that has not happened anywhere else that has happened in this uh, particular report. Conversely, uh, if there's a word that repeats a lot of times in a report, and it keeps repeating in a lot of other reports as well, then that's probably a word that repeats itself. For example, a word like a uh, or the, which is obviously a stop word, right? So TFIDF kind of acts as a stop word filter um, in a sense, and that helps us deal with stop words furthermore. So here's a snapshot of a TFIDF matrix, uh, the rows 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 are different reports and the columns, as you can see, are all the different words uh, in the entire um, collection of documents. Uh, you can see it starts all the way with the alphabet A, goes all the way to Y, and each of these reports has a different score for each of the words. Um, some of the words have a highest, higher score defined by the TFIDF matrix. So the final step, and probably the most boring step, is training the model, because we're feeding in the TFIDF matrix, we're choosing a classification algorithm, and we're training the model. 
we're just going to let it train for a long time, and then we're going to take a look at the results. Um, but this example works really well for a label data set, like I've talked about before. We need labels for this to work. So what happens when we don't have labels? Well, just like one of the big software company out there says, there's an app for that. I would say there's an application for that as well. Um, topic modeling, which we kind of spoke about earlier, works for unsupervised learning problems. So let's say I have a collection of huge ma uh, maintenance reports. Uh, um, let's say around 100 gigabytes of maintenance reports. And that's a lot of data. And I just don't have the manpower to sit and label all the maintenance reports based on different topics. Can a machine learning algorithm figure out what topic each report relates to? Absolutely. As you can see here, four different arrows colored in different colors. You see topic one relates to radioactive incidents in water systems. Um, and the CN arrow, the second one, talks about power problems, um, especially relating to voltage and transformers. Um, the third arrow talks about fuel rod issues. And the fourth arrow in red talks about radiation relating to plant personnel. So all of this, um, all of this classification or unsupervised classification, I should say, was done without any sort of labels. So 100 gigs of data, throw it into the system, and this is what we get outside, um, out of the, out of the uh, AI model. So of course, um, I've shown you all the really nice stuff about NLP, but there's, there's a few places where it can go um, pretty, pretty wrong. Um, so pronouns, you know, gender agreement, number agreement, writing two instead of the numerical, numerical representation or a Roman numerical even might add a lot of confusion to the model. If it has not seen Roman numericals before, uh, it would just um, not have um, a good time with it. And this is just one of uh, the two presentations that I'm giving. So if you stick on for a little longer, then I'm gonna talk about a real use case that we're working on and I'm really excited to show you about. That's all about NLP and I will hand it over to Christine for our time series. Hi everyone, thank you very much Yashwan. Hi, my name is Christine Lee and I, along with Yashwan, I'm an every data scientist in our nuclear innovation team. Uh, with our data-driven decision-making program. Uh, today, I'm gonna be giving you a brief intro into my specialty area, which is time series. So what is time series? Time series itself might sound really simple, just a string of numbers or indicators with some sort of timestamp. However, in order to take advantage of the powerful models that we have available to us via classical and AI methods, our time series does need to have a few requirements met. And the three of them are, is that it needs to be consistent, unique, and sequential. What I mean by consistent is that it needs to have equally spaced time intervals. It also needs to be unique, so you can't have duplicated timestamps, especially when they contain different values. A classic example of this is daylight saving time when fall is repeated during fall back. Finally, it needs to be sequential. Now, I know this sounds really obvious, but timestamps need to be in order of increasing time, and events can't happen inside of each other, and ideally, there should be a full sequence of data. So now you're wondering, why go through all the trouble of making sure your data is in this workable format? Well, that's because time series analysis and modeling can provide us with some very valuable information about the systems that we care about and how they work. So whether or not it's looking at residential AMI data or sensors in a steam turbine, we want to use time series to understand the past and be able to predict the future of the assets that we care about in the power industry. So in that vein, time series can inform us of three things. One, are there any long-term trends? Two, are there any regularly occurring seasonal patterns? And finally, three, are there any irregular or cyclic patterns to our data? Now, as my previous colleagues have emphasized, AI covers an overlap of not only machine learning methods, 
but classical ones from statistics and data science as well. In addition to that, time series has a very long history of classical methods, so it makes sense to mention some of them here. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but instead I have decided to present an umbrella of the basic classes of model in each thing. So, for classical methods, I always like to call out a fan favorite, linear regression. It's visually easy to understand. It is highly flexible to expansion into the multivariate sense by adding more variables, and it's a really good tool for first-order approximations for more black box AI models. Simple exponential smoothing is a class of models that are really good to start with when you're not able to initially see if your time series has a clear trend or seasonality to it. Um, exponential smoothing then can be added to add trending or seasonality by adding a whole winter's adjustment. Now, autoregressive integrated moving average or RMM models are a great example of a model class that relies on autocorrelation or the property that your future forecasts depends on lag in values and model errors. And like exponential smoothing, it can be expanded into the seasonal sense with seasonal RMM. Now, for machine learning counterparts, one of my favorite supervised methods is classification and regression trees, CART, or its counterpart, random forests. Now, similar to linear regression, it's a very visually easy concept to understand and easy to explain in heuristic terms. My colleagues have introduced the concept of neural networks in their presentations, where a simple neural network has a single hidden layer for computation and is really excellent for nonlinear relationships. For time series, I'd like to introduce the neural network counterpart, the recurrent neural network, which has the added bonus of a recurring or ordered time series element. Now to take the recurrent neural network a step further, I would also like to mention the long short-term memory or LSTM model. It's a special subclass of RNN that has the added feature of having a persistent memory element in its predictive ability. Okay, great. So we know about these time series models and which one should I pick and why? Well, this is what one of the biggest forecasting competitions in the world has sought to find out. Every decade, the M competition seeks to evaluate and compare the accuracy of many different forecasting models. The most recent competition, the M4, has concluded where competitors were asked to task, uh, were a task to create forecasting models that would accurately predict 100,000 different time series. Their, their findings were published in the International Journal of Forecasting, and while there are seven major takeaways, there are two that I would really like to highlight for our introductory session today. The first one is that the poorest performing models were pure ML, followed by pure statistics. The second major takeaway was that the best models were actually hybrids of both classical statistical ones and machine learning. In fact, the winning model was a hybrid of exponential smoothing and a recurring neural network. So the takeaway here for you guys is that just as AI is an incredibly interdisciplinary field, we should be open to testing many kinds of methods in your AI journey. So regardless as to what method you decide to choose in your AI project, whether it be with natural language processing, image processing, or time series, none of this can happen without data, which brings me to my next segment, the importance of data and AI. So as I've mentioned in my intro, I work at EPRI's data-driven decision-making program. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, we feel that data can help us in several ways in our goals in the energy industry. They include learning from the past for, with insights, anticipating the future with prognostics, increasing efficiency with optimization, and finally increasing reliability with automation. Now, before I get started with all the cool methods that my colleagues presented, I'd like to do an introductory look at what the different types of data are that we have available to us. There is structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. So if I could use an analogy, I would say that structured data is like a building. It is consistent and rigid. 
One such example is numerical time series in tables from AMI or plant sensors. Now the opposite type of this data from structured is unstructured. And the analogy that I would use here is that unstructured data is irregular and variable just like the ocean. An energy example here would be reports or satellite images of vegetation. And then finally, there's a somewhere in between, which is semi-structured data. So to fully complete the analogy, semi-structured data would be like having a pool. You have the building structure of a barrier, but it is able to contain a variable medium, which is water. The energy examples here include work order data with freeform comments or JSON pricing signals from an API call. Great, so we know what the different types of data are that are available to us, but why is metadata important in addition to the data that we currently have? A really common mistake in AI is simply dumping all of your data into an analysis method, hoping for great results. However, doing this actually usually yields pretty poor metrics, and that's because most data needs other forms of information to learn, such as metadata, in order to better inform your AI models. So instead of talking about this in a general sense, I want to give you some concrete energy examples of ways that metadata can help your analysis. So say for a structured time series from Plant Historian, say you want to do a correlation analysis. If you have metadata, uh, such as plant component diagrams, you'll better be able to see if the components are lagged in time series or in, par in parallel, and it'll give you more explanatory power. Uh, for unstructured data, say you have satellite images of vegetation and you want to do some edge, edge detection, having GPS coordinates as your metadata is really helpful so that you can align it with asset location information. Finally, with an example of semi-structured data, such as work orders, you might want to do remaining useful life analysis on your largest components. Having plant commission date will help you get a more accurate endpoint than assuming the start of the work order date in your records. So working with real world data also comes with real world problems and missing data is one of them. What most people don't know is there's actually many different types of missing data and it comes with a, a variety of risks when using them. The three types of missing data are MCAR, missing completely at random, MAR, missing at random, and finally, MNAR, or missing but not at random. And the best way to differentiate between the three is with an energy example. So let's assume that you have a plant sensor that measures pressure. If the data from the plant sensor, sensor is missing completely at random, that means that, say for example, missing values occur when the sensor breaks. When a sensor breaks, that usually happens at random and it's not dependent on other data. And there's a low risk for bias when, using this, when having this kind of missing data. Now, if the plant sensor data is missing at random, it could be that the missing values happen just on the weekend when the facility staff is not on duty. So your day of the week variable is the conditional variable for your pressure data. Now in this case, you do need to proceed with caution. There is a potential risk for bias, but at least you know what the conditional variable is. Now finally, if your plant sensor data is missing, not at random, this may occur when the missing values happen when the pressure sensor gets overloaded. So the fact that the pressure sensor is overloaded and not recording is the reason for the missing pressure. Now in this case, you need to proceed with extreme caution as there's a high risk of bias because it's your sensing element itself that's causing the missing data. So, in the many ways that data can be missing, we actually do have, luckily, a lot of mitigation strategies. You can ignore, you can delete, you can impute, you can synthesize, and finally, you can contextualize. Now, when you ignore missing data, you're simply choosing a method of analysis that doesn't require a full set of observations and can easily skip to the next variable or value. Naive models and random forests are capable of doing this. Now, if you delete your data, that's something different from ignoring it. So that means you're removing the entire row completely. Now, this is okay for data that is missing completely at random, 
for the consequence is just information loss. However, this is fraught with potential bias for if your data is missing at random or missing not at random. Now, a really common way to deal with missing data is imputation, and there are a lot of great methods out there, both univariate and multivariate. I would say choose the best one uh, that meets your needs based on explainability and ease of computation. Now, finally, you might find yourself in a situation where you have a large part of your data missing or there's very little data to spare. Now, in that case, you can try synthesizing your data. Just be sure to do this with care and make sure you really understand the physical system. Now, both statistics and machine learning offer a wide variety of methods that you can use to synthesize data. Pick the one, again, that helps best with your explainability and ease of computation. Now, finally, with any missing data problem, I can't emphasize it enough that context is really important. There is no better source for context of your missing data than your energy SME. They can definitely tell you what is a reasonable value, what is not a reasonable value, and all you always give you that voice of sanity that data must always follow the laws of physics. Okay, great. So a common question that gets asked is how much data do we need for AI? And I would say that the real answer is it depends. And we're not going to offer absolute numbers here, but there are several good criteria with these heuristic examples here for when you're gathering data for your project. Um, we have six listed here. I'm just going to go over three today for time, um, but they are model complexity, uh, your training procedure, and finally, your tolerance for error. Now, with model complexity, if you're just doing a simple model, let's just say linear regression, in theory, all you need to draw a line is just two points. Now, that would be a very boring analysis, but that being said, a simple technique doesn't require hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, and it won't be computationally difficult. Now, say if you're looking at a much more complex forecasting model, like a neural network, Say you want to model, I don't know, climatological effects that require much more data. You may say need 30 years worth if you're trying to capture um, global weather oscillation cycles. The next thing you could look at is the type of training procedure that you do. Again, whether or not it is a simple or complex. You know, if you're doing an 80-20 split for your uh, train and test, and say you have 100 data points, that, that can work, right? Um, you'd have 80 points to train on and 20 points to test on. However, if you decide in your training procedure that you want to do a tenfold cross-validation, keep in mind that 100 data points divided by 10 yields only 10 points per training session. So you only then have eight points to train on and two points to test on. So you probably want a bit more data than that. Finally, you have your error tolerance. Now, if you have a low-risk task, such as um, detecting cra cracks in concrete, or I'm sorry, if you have a low risk task such as predicting weather, you don't really need that much data. However, if you have a high risk problem, such as detecting cracks in concrete or billing errors, you'll definitely want a lot more data so that your predictive AI is much more robust. But in any case, we should always try to aim for data quality over quantity. Now, regardless as to how much data you have, we have a duty to treat our data and the resulting analysis in an appropriate manner. There, you know, these analyses can impact people and there's always the potential for bias. Now, I need to preface this with, I am not a lawyer, and you should always discuss your data and analysis, analysis confidentiality with your legal department. We're simply giving an introduction here to the things that you need to consider when you're handling your data. So, for example, if you're working with customer data, you may be working with personally identical information. There are a wide variety of data privacy laws out there, varying between states and even countries. If you're working with plant data, then you're working with uh, critical energy or infrastructure information. Also keep in mind that some data may be subject to export control, and this encompasses the export of goods, software, and technology that could be used uh, in the, against the interests of the exporting country. 
And finally, some data might be related to antitrust, which is the regulation of business conduct to promote competition. And keep in mind, as these technologies progress and as well as change, these legal procedures will evolve and update as well. So in any of your cases, when you're handling your data and the assuming analysis, you know, you really need to consider how much bias or what potential bias that there could be. Um, this is something that actually our next speaker is going to be talking about with Graham. And if you want a deeper dive into the ethics of data and, I, and AI, you should turn in to day two tomorrow where my colleague Yashwant will be doing a presentation on that. So thank you very much. All right, thank you for that uh, great lead in, Christine. Um, my name is Graham Johnson. I have the distinct pleasure of being here today from the National Renewable Energy Lab. And I get to give a brief primer on explainability and bias in AI and where those are gonna show up, how they're related, how they're different, um, and things to kind of keep in mind as we move forward. Um, before jumping in, just a, a quick overview of who I am and kind of why I'm talking about this today and, and some of my biases on these talks uh, is I have a background in engineering and applied mathematics, uh, but these days I get to work at NREL uh, in the Computational Science Center, uh, actually studying visualization science and primarily looking at interactive visual analytics and collaborative workflows um, and really helping to people uh, enable deep comprehensions of complex systems. Um, and so doing that through a visual lens today, you know, we'll see that machine learning and AI touch and deal with automating complex systems or modeling complex systems, but at the same time, uh, machine learning models can be complex systems in of themselves. So what does it mean when we want to talk about explainability and try to understand and actually interpret the decisions that can be made by these models? So at a high level, um, explainable AI or XAI, as you may see in literature sometimes, is really referring to this concept of how does AI work? How is a model arriving at a particular decision? And can we make that clearly understandable by humans? So as we've kind of seen previously in some of the talks when we're, we're looking at machine learning models, many of these tend to be opaque. Um, they can be non-intuitive and, and very challenging for humans to decode if you're not an expert or if you're not the person who built that model. This is definitely dependent on the structure of the machine learning model at play to begin with. Um, a simple example is taking a comparison of a, a deep neural net that may have thousands of layers or even hundreds of thousands of features versus a random forest where you have a very nice hierarchical format or a nice visual interpretation of what decisions are being made. And kind of with that in mind, um, that structure really can lend different approaches to deriving explainability for these different types of models. So if I wanna ask how and what and why, it can depend on the model that's being employed or models being employed, but it also really depends on who needs the explanation. You know, who is being explained to? Is this the model developer who wants help training and debugging? Is this a decision maker or a stakeholder or some kind of end user? Um, the explainability really can lend, uh, you know, different credence depending on what types of questions are being asked. Um, there's lots of approaches that you can see in explainability in the literature. One of the early ones um, that you can follow this link is actually coming out of DARPA, um, and they have a very nice program set up around kind of encouraging explainable AI. And it's really at a high level split into two pieces. Um, we want to be able to produce more explainable models and maintain this high level of accuracy while enabling these humans to understand and actually trust the models that are being deployed and manage them in the field. And kind of the one key piece there is we want to produce explainable models. And sometimes there is a trade-off trade -off between how high performant they can be. Um, that's definitely a deeper dive and a little bit outside of the scope, but it's good to keep in mind that some context of explainability does have a trade-off or can have a trade-off um, with how performant or accurate it really can be. Um, we'll see a couple examples on the next slide, but you know, some simple aids uh, for explainability as there's no panacea, no solution for one fits all, especially you have to keep in mind what model is at play and what types of explanations do we really need for these users. Um, but looking at dependencies, why did a certain input lead to a certain output? So a saliency map or some kind of akin to that as we would see in deep neural nets or reinforcement learning. Um, looking at feature and attribution visualizations. Um, and at the same time, leading into more of the bias that we'll see in a minute is actually looking at patterns and statistics over large areas of output or long times of output and seeing how the models are actually performing in those ways. Um, it's very important to, to take a mixture of approaches when you're looking at explainability. And it's, again, one thing to, to build a machine learning model. It's another thing to be able to actually explain why it's producing the certain types of results that it does and, and trying to lower that bar for 
an end user not needing to be an expert in machine learning to understand or have an explanation as to why. Um, to that end, you know, some there's many examples that we'll see, and this is definitely a hot topic um, within machine learning, and especially as I mentioned, XAI is this kind of field in literature. At this top left, there's a really neat article called the building blocks of interpretability. And what this is doing is it's an image classification type of an example, but it's actually joining feature visualization. So what a neuron in this network will see with attribution analysis. So how is that actually affecting the output? And a lot of times these studies are, are done independently, um, but this is actually brought together in conjunction with some really neat matrix factorization techniques that allow really low level users as well as high level users to gain insights to why is a certain image being classified a certain way. Uh, on the right here, this Google What If tool um, is really neat. Um, it's something that you can actually import a type of machine learning model that you may have trained into. Um, and you can then bring in some of the input data with it and actually investigate how it's going to behave as I perturb or as I alter little pieces of that data or those features and see what's actually being changed as an output. Definitely helps you to understand a lot of the internals. And one of the main questions kind of in my realm is actually looking at a taxonomy of XAI. You know, with, it's again, thinking about the end user, who are we deriving explainability for and trying to determine what types of questions should be there. Are they local or global questions? Are they more internals to the model or are they more implications of output? Um, the how, what's, why's and when's coming out of IBM is, is a very neat thing. And it's something again, to keep in mind as you're looking for explainability in AI and in ML of what kind of explainability do I need for this type of example? Again, there's, there's not a panacea or a one size fits all. Um, so definitely take that into consideration. So when we think about explainability and trying to actually understand how and why a model is giving a certain output, another really related topic is bias in AI. And that's a really succinct way of saying, is this model unfairly favoring certain outcomes? And that can kind of creep up in a number of ways. We have this goal in AI and, and specifically in ML here that we wanna create systems and models that are fair, objective, and accurate. But at the same time, for now, most of these models are made by humans and we possess various biases, whether those are implicit or explicit, and that can actually lend itself internally to the algorithms that we develop. Um, there's a number of topics that are gonna surround bias and how you can classify different types as it would show up. A couple of these here can be split kind of into two main forks. So algorithmic biases are things that are actually going to end up embedded into the machine learning models that we create. And this can be due to a number of sources. Um, as Christine kind of just talked about, data collection and cleaning and that training process can introduce a number of sources of bias and there's a sampling bias that can take place there. How do you deal with missing data, for example? There could be internal technical limitations. A very simple high level example is maybe your model uses a random number generator, but that random number generator isn't actually perfect or it's not being reseeded. So there's an easy bias on a technical side there. And one of the ones that's a little tricky to find, and, and there's an iterative approach, as we'll see on the next slide, is this confirmation bias. So I have this expectation or idea of how something should be performing, and I can build a model around that to kind of continue to reinforce or to show me those types of things. And one that has come up and we can kind of see is this emergent bias. Maybe I have a machine learning model that is actively being deployed in the field, and it's not actually seeing data that it was trained for. Uh, maybe the training set wasn't fully representative of what it was supposed to be, or it doesn't align with the samples in the algorithm. So this measurement bias um, is something that can kind of give credence to, I need to retrain this model, or maybe I should readopt approach to have an online learning approach, something that's actively updating as we go. And to just keep in mind, there's, there's a quote here, and the succinctity of it is, a lot of times psychologically when we're thinking about developing models is we kind of make a decision first when we're asked a question we've kind of already made a decision and then we generate an explanation around that so we have to be very cognizant and aware especially on our teams of making sure we we actually allow the data to tell that story and we're not crafting this confirmation bias that comes into play um, the tools that we'll see in, in uncovering these biases can be very related to some of the explainable AI tools we just saw, um, but at the same time kind of have a fundamentally different question. They don't necessarily care directly about the internal structures uh, of your machine learning model or how that's being deployed, but necessarily how that's behaving over time. Um, so usually more of that ensemble idea of looking at how is this behavior happening, uncovering those patterns, and then trying to reiterate back through um, that model development. 
And that kind of comes into this external audit system. So that's something that can be part of your development cycle and finding out, you know, has my machine learning model met its end? Does it need to be retrained? Um, is it robust enough to kind of handle this? And really going through that process, thinking about biases and how those sources could come in from whether that's training data or the technical limitations of my algorithm or some confirmation pieces can really pay dividends if we keep those in mind. We can understand our model's really true accuracies, what their true limitations can be, and actually help explain when they should and shouldn't be used. Um, bias is a really hot topic. There's lots of, pick, you know, pick your favorite example, so to speak. Um, there's two at the top here. You don't need to read these words, but this first one is looking at how could bias kind of creep into utility systems in the energy grid. And there's two main examples within that that can be kind of related to others. It's, you know, think about I have an automated process or an ML algorithm that's going to decide whether to buy or produce electricity. So am I generating or am I going to buy right now? If I have biases encoded in there without myself knowing, those could have serious generation impacts or also serious economic impacts. And more related to like canonical examples, as you'll see, like, you know, a loan application process where bias can come into play. Maybe we have services that are available to certain types of customers and the types of data that we're bringing on, in on those customers may have inher inherent biases that we need to be aware of. So our model isn't, you know, disproportionately going about deciding things. Um, at the bottom left here, uh, McKinsey and Co has done a number of kind of ideas that's encapsulating some of this. It's, it's again, thinking holistically of explainability and bias within ML and how we should be thinking about that as an iterative design process, making sure we actually invest in that research, uh, have a multidisciplinary team and take a look at that. Uh, I definitely encourage you to, to dig in. The MIT Technology Review has a number of great articles that talk about how you should inspect algorithms for bias, where that might creep up. Um, and we're definitely going to see a lot more of a deeper dive into this tomorrow. So um, keep in mind, explainability and bias are very linked and related. Um, but again, ask yourself fundamental questions of what is needing to be explained, who is the person that needs to be explained to, or groups of people that need to be explained to, and how could my data or how could my models be bringing biases forward, keeping those questions in mind. So with that, I, I would say thank you, and I appreciate your time and look forward to answering some questions in the discussion panel. Hi to everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Adrian Kelly. I work as a, I'm a principal uh, project manager with uh, EPRI in the IGES uh, team. I'm going to talk today about an uh, example use case of um, AI, uh, specifically reinforcement learning, uh, called the Learning to Run a Power Network Challenge. And the aim here is to develop a functional digital assistant uh, for the control center uh, real-time operations. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anthony James in the chat who, who teed this uh, uh, presentation up nicely, who asked the question, uh, can reinforcement learning be used uh, for uh, resilient uh, power grids? So hopefully we'll aim to answer that in the next uh, couple of slides. Um, so uh, as part of the L2RPN challenge, the Learning to Run a Power Network Challenge, our, one of our key aims was to try to and break down or, or break down the wall between uh, the power system engineering community on one side and the AI um, machine learning uh, experts on the other side. Um, because, because what we, we realized pretty quickly is that uh, power systems people are very narrowly focused on engineering solutions or solutions that have always worked, uh, optimization algorithms, which will run into uh, computational barriers as we try to decarbonize the grid and, and reach climate goals. Whereas on the other side of the wall, the AI community are experts in their field, but um, might not have the use cases or or the uh, access to data um, that's needed to develop um, their their capabilities and technologies. What we wanted to do with out to RPN was break down that wall um, and link the link the two communities. This started last year uh, with a development of a, of a white paper where we introduced the concept of reinforcement learning for system operations. The link is here uh, in the slide deck. So the project team got together, wrote this. Uh, and, and released it, and it set the stage for the uh, for the L2 RPN challenge that we we developed last year. So, so what is that, or how, how do we use it, or wh where did it originate from, and and and, and where is it going to? So, uh, reinforcement learning as a tool has traditionally been um, narrowly focused on you know the gaming world. So, the the Google DeepMind. Um, you know, learn to control this Atari in, in, I don't know, 120 steps or something like that. Um, and you have AlphaGo, these types of things that, that have been there, but uh, not as many kind of use cases out in the industry. This has kind of changed in recent years. Um, the, the project team have got their inspiration from this learning to run um, challenge um, at Europe. Um, 
and and uh, inspired by that, figured that um, what about if we try to cast the problem of network operations or real time network operations as a learning to run uh, type challenge. Um, so that that gave us the that set the scene to 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 develop this this, this challenge uh, in in 2019, and and we're still running uh, running it along today. So what exactly does it does it involve? We're trying to develop a uh, an agent that will sit in parallel with the control center operator, so act almost like a, an autopilot uh, for the human operator uh, to run a power network. If that means something to redispatch the system, uh, to, to redispatch generation, or to control the grid to alleviate overloads. It was started with a small feasibility challenges um, on small grids, uh, small stable grids in 2019, um, this was scaled up to a larger grid or a portion of this IEEE 118 grid. Um, there was maintenance schedules um, included here, and it was a, a year-long time series. And then last year, uh, this was launched at the New Europe Sustainable World Challenge, where there was two different tracks. One was robustness, and the other one was adaptability. Um, robustness meant that agents had to control uh, the grid when the lines were being taken out of service or were under attack. Adaptability meant there were uh, very large grids with two sets of resources, one with a lot of renewables, one with not so many renewables, which was changing throughout the day. So agents were trained on these grids and evaluated on uh, evaluated blindly on new sets of scenarios. And uh, quickly, I click the wrong button. Quickly on the results um, of the challenge last year. So these were the blind tests. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, this was a do nothing agent. So if an agent sat and did not act on the network, it, the, the grid blacked out in 22 out of 24 different scenarios. The top three winning submitted agents um, were able to keep the grid alive through dispatch actions in 16 agents in the case of the winning agent, and then uh, 13 agents in the case of uh, the second and third agents. This was pretty uh, very impressive performance. Um, including some hu superhuman actions, or what we would call superhuman actions, so rapid re-switching on the network uh, to alleviate overloads or, or, or congestions or con contingencies on on the system. Um, this is very very promising uh, for future for future versions of this challenge. And finally, uh, just on conclusions, um, yeah, we, we we think that machine learning reinforcement learning very very promising for for control problems, especially actions on the grid, should help with resiliency and reliability. Um, we we think it's possible to to learn topology controllers, um, and this will broaden the research area. We've got open collaboration, a very big community of, of people contributing agents and working on this all the time. All of the agents are open sourced, so people can take them, the winning agents, and, and work on them or iterate them. Um, we need to develop a framework uh, for, for this type of challenge so, so that they can be repeated and the same baselines and benchmarks can be used. Um, and we need to kind of incentivize um, researchers to work on these. This is why these challenges with cash prizes or different prizes, we're going to keep working on these, especially this year in 2021, we're going to run two more L2RPN challenges. Um, and you can learn more, I guess, at uh, epi.com slash L2RPN for more details about the challenge and, and upcoming challenges in 2021. That's me. Thank you. All right, so I'm Doug Dorr. I've been with EPRI for about 25 years now, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, multispectral satellite imagery and a repository that we're developing around the uh, around that particular topic. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with geospatial intelligence tools or what we call geospatial intelligence tools. So examples are Google Earth and some of the open source products like uh, ArcGIS. And if you've been around long enough, you probably remember a, uh, uh, the original tool that Microsoft and TerraServer collaborated on where you could amazingly go in and look at your, uh, look at the top of your house or look at some, uh, some area that uh, uh, was, was pretty amazing at the time. All these systems, uh, they've been fantastic learning tools for us to understand our environment with a more spatially aware perspective. And even more importantly, to understand it with the idea that we can take different kinds of mixed reality layers and attributes like, say, fire threat areas or vegetation health or 
other other attributes, whether that's just uh, labels on roads or speed limits or something like that. And, and we can take all of this and, and we can understand the, uh, the geospatial data with just a lot more clarity and a lot more uh, resolution than we could otherwise. So uh, the, the challenge with the free imagery is that it does come with some usability gaps. So for example, resolution is a challenge. Some areas are just not, uh, not detailed enough. Others, we've got flyover data versus satellite data, so we, we just don't get uh, exactly what we want from a use case perspective. Or perhaps the image is uh, three years old and hasn't been updated for the last three years. Or the image is just completely missing. So these, these challenges are, uh, are one of the things that we're trying to address in this uh, uh, EPRI TI work. The idea is to curate multiple multi-spectral satellite data sets, which means that it's not just the visible spectrum, but it's also the invisible spectrum that uh, that's available from some of the satellite imagery providers. And what we uh, what we intend to do with this is answer some of the key R and D questions around uh, first how the electric power industry can leverage an image repository to support our most beneficial use cases. So instead of each of us having to go to the vendors and curate our own repository, can we do this as an industry and all learn from what we, we're all doing in terms of, of uh, uh, those specific use cases that are most valuable to us? Secondly, can we, can we quantify some of the cost savings in the other trade-offs like resolution compared to say flyovers? or uh, drive-bys or the most expensive thing, which is uh, uh, boots on the ground. Now, we can't, we can't remove that from the equation, but the question is, can we use satellite imagery to, uh, to change the game in terms of the costs of some of that? So those are just some of the questions that we're trying to answer in this. Uh, another one is just, are we, uh, are we getting the most out of geospatial analytics, or do we need to develop some AI platforms that allow us to use natural language processing to uh, query the data in ways where we don't have to program anything in. We just ask the questions like we would with, uh, with Alexa or with Siri. And then uh, are there opportunities with our, uh, with our members to facilitate a vendor bake-off? So these are, I just wanted to kind of present what we're doing here. The, the image you see, that's an example of some at-risk trees that we identified from the satellite imagery. And, uh, you know, the AI is going to help us learn how long have they been at risk and when are they going to actually not have any leaves on them at all and when are they going to be dead and ready to fall into the power lines. So there's, there's a lot to be done in this, but we're, uh, we're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of starting to curate this repository for all of, uh, all of our members. And I will turn it over to the next presenter from here. All right, thank you so much. I'm back. Um, so this is, this is going to be the last presentation um, of mine for uh, This is AI. And I think the last presentation for the agenda today, we're going to have a panel discussion after this. So let's wrap up with a really neat use case for NLP. So for this, I want to talk about how NLP is not a plug and play use case in uh, the in the nuclear industry because um, I could see a lot of questions talking about, you know, how how do I get started with classification? Do the NLP libraries, can they be just used for building models right off the bat? Well, yes and no, because there are a lot of challenges um, for industry specific settings. So let's take a look at that. Um, so this is going to be a really sharp one. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, just a brief overview about NLP and its challenges. Why do we need a specific language model in the nuclear sector? Um, and um, how are we going to get there? How are we going to build this new language model? You know, this, this language model is kind of similar to, let's say, an English model or a Chinese model um, that's capable of learning all the different words, all the different um, um, relationships between words, uh, but this is going to be a really industry-specific use case. Um, a quick recap on NLP. 
Um, it's used as a conversion process of converting language that we speak, talk, and understand to machine understandable uh, format, um, zeros and ones. So it's um, NLP has kind of taken off in the last uh, several years. Um, it's moving more towards the um, slightly less explainable AI part. There are a lot of black box NLP models out there that just do magic, but it's kind of hard to interpret how they're doing it in the um, in the long run. So um, this is how NLP usually works, right? You go to your favorite search engine, you type in, and it tries to autocomplete. That's an NLP model at work. Um, and autocomplete for emails or for your notes, that's NLP. Um, tagging if an email is spam or not, that's an NLP use case. Uh, so these are all great use cases, and these are re really generic use cases, right? Um, there's no there's no sort of a complex language model that needs to be learned. This is just plain straightforward English in this use in this use case. Um, but if you kind of do a deep dive into how people usually use language as a tool to communicate, uh, it can get quite messy. Because, for example, the first sentence here, my sister has a dog and she loves her a lot, is pretty straight and um, simple and straightforward. We can understand that. But the model doesn't know what she loves her a lot means. Because, I mean, OK, the sister has a dog, makes sense. But who is she? And who is loving who? Uh, so this sort of a this ambu ambiguation and sort of confusion turns up in a lot of smart assistants, if you've noticed as well. Um, you know, I will not take the words for the people listening to this presentation on speakers, but you know, the digital smartest assistants living on your phone and homes, um, they just can't have a conversation. They can answer a question, but they can't have a conversation. And that's one of the huge challenges of NLP. Um, understanding the context is really important in the way people, uh, change language based on their backgrounds is also a pretty big challenge. And if you think the challenges end there, you are really uh, at just at the tip of the iceberg. It gets really, really complicated. So here's a snapshot of what NLP can be done in the uh, nuclear industry. As you can see, um, Corrective action reports, work order data, and research documents, everything, all of these data sets have a lot of words in them. You can use NLP to do a lot of different use cases. For example, a um, couple of use cases that I've already talked about is um, uh, even classification, contamin contamination, even detection, um, cost analysis, figuring it out, figuring out what strategies are good for maintenance of a plant. Uh, what sort of component replacement would be the best for a plant at a given um, point of time, and so on. So these use cases sound really good. Um, they sound really robust, but here's the curveball, right? Just how we humans use language, even though English is kind of a universal language and we all understand it, a lot of people make slight changes to it that makes it super complicated for a machine learning model to understand. The green boxes that you see here, the green dialog boxes, basically say the same thing. But you can see the, the, uh, the variated variation of verbiage used in the text here, right? One is a really complex acronym filled text. One is a really simple explanation. The other one is a half complete uh, text with little to no grammar uh, and no full stops, no None of that sort. So, and this is just a small sample. The, uh, I'm showing you an example of three, but there can be 45 of these in a single data set. And how do we go about dealing with this, right? Um, how do we go about figuring out what the, what the report actually says um, by understanding all of the different variations of this language? So this is where the um, nuclear language model comes into play. So the model, I think the next slide talks about it more. So in order to figure out how, how to make this nuclear language model happen, here's a short introduction on word vectors. 
so word vectors are you know uh, a marriage between words language and mathematics uh, vector space right so if you see the diagram at the top here you see um, how a man is related to a woman similarly an uncle is related to an aunt and a king is related to a queen so this sort of representation or this sort of uh, relationship is built within an AI system after it's trained on a bunch of data. So this is what word vectors are. So if you look at the big, um, big diagram at the bottom, uh, you see four different classes, king, queen, woman, and princes, and you see a lot of different factors that vary for each one of them. Uh, for example, the age for a king and queen is high, but for a princess, it's really low. And that makes sense for us, right? But this, this, this is how the machine makes sense of it, right? Um, so it understands this relationship that king and queen are two entities who are, um, who are not that young, who have a lot of royalty and masculinity factor, uh, you know, who have a lot of femininity factor is a queen or a woman and, um, you know, someone with a lot of age and a royalty and a low femininity score is a king. So this is how words, uh, an AI model makes sense of words. And this, this approach is called word vectors. Uh, a really cool um, visualization of word vectors is um, something that's shown here. Um, it's about capital cities. As you can see, um, the, there's a relationship between uh, a country and its capital city. So this, this is a learned model, uh, a model that has learned the English language, has figured out, you know, that Greece, Athens, Italy, Rome, Russia, Moscow, Turkey, Ankara, all of these are equidistant. By equidistant, I mean they're equally distant from each other. So the model has learned that there's a relationship that's common for all of these different words. And what's the relationship? Capitals, right? So that's that's something that a human is really uh, easy to uh, easily capable of understanding, but a model kind of needs a primer to understand it. It understands understands numbers in the vector space. So this makes the representation for us easily understandable. And it makes it really easy for the model to learn the representation in uh, vector space as well. So this is an example in uh, you know, the normal uh, English language. But if you transfer that into nuclear, uh, into the nuclear industry, it could look something like this. This might seem like um, a really simple diagram, but it kind of encapsulates the same information. Uh, the two blocks on the left, rad waste pump and cooling pump are two different components in a nuclear power plant. And the two, uh, and they connect to three different entities, right? Radioactivity, leak, and workers. So basically what it's saying is, um, if the model has learned uh, the word rad waste pump, then it can relate rad waste pump to two different um, uh, two different words. One is the radioactivity and the other is a leak. So if a report mentions rad waste pump, then probably there is a mention of radioactivity somewhere in that report. And probably that report is talking about a leak that eventually led to radioactive um, and radioactivity event. So similarly for the cooling pump, it's a leak, but this leak is affecting workers. This is this leak is affecting plant personnel working in the nuclear power plant. So this is kind of a really high level representation of word vectors. Um, and in order to build this, there's you know a lot of lot of uh, data curation process that needs to be done, uh, and that's currently being done at um, Epri. We're uh, researching on it. Uh, but this uh, this sort of a representation is really important for building models capable of doing really, really powerful applications. Uh, for example, recommendations for corrective action reports. So similar to the example that I showed a few slides ago, uh, people have different ways of reporting stuff. All of them might be in English. All of them will have different verbiage. Uh, people might use acronyms, full uh, the full expanded versions of acronyms, or you know they might use a shortcut, which probably is not even an acronym in the first place. So how do you make sense of all of this? You build a language model that that's capable of relating all the different entities, all the different acronyms, synonyms, 
all the different verbiages to a particular word. Um, similarly, um, that's can, that can be used for recommending the action to be taken on corrective action reports. So let's say I have 100 different correction active report, uh, corrective action reports. And if a human has to go through all of those reports manually and um, you know, label the next set of actions to be taken on it, that's gonna take a lot of hours. But if an AI model is capable of auto recommending what sort of an action um, that the report has to be uh, uh, marked with, then that saves a lot of uptime, right? It's similar to autocomplete that we have on our phones, um, but it's it's more for the utility sector. It's more for the nuclear power plants. Similarly, um, understanding you know uh, the work order history analysis, uh, the work order history for a plant, uh, understanding you know what different events have um, happened in the past because. The same person is not going, going to write the report each and every time, right? It's going to be a different person, but the plan is going to be the same. So we kind of have to generalize all the different reports and make sure that you know there's no different set of acronyms separating uh, uh, reports. You know, there's no language separating reports, but you know all of those uh, all of those different terms have to come together and compile in a in a really neat way. So this is this is a quite a big challenge. Um, and we're gonna talk about if you are going to uh, attend day two tomorrow, we're gonna talk about how we have started approaching this problem. But um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of powerful ways of um, uh, making this uh, work. And this is just one of the methods. And that concludes my presentation and uh, I, I guess we have the panel discussion coming up next. So, Jeremy, back to you, I guess. Hey, Jeremy, I guess you're muted. That I am, I think I owe everyone a drink. All right, so. Thank you to everyone who has presented so far. So we'll now turn the time over to Christine Lee for the panel session. Hello, everyone. So if I could direct our panelists to turn their videos back on and I'll reintroduce everyone. So we have four panelists today for you. We have Siobhan from Stanford. We have Graham from NREL, Yashwant from EPRI, and Pratik from EPRI as well. As you recall, Siobhan talked about for introduction to AI, Graham talked about explainability and bias in AI. He talked about the introductions to uh, machine learning techniques in AI and image processing, and then Yashwant discussed NLP. So we got a lot of really good questions today. If we haven't already responded to them in the chat for you, please email us at ai at epri.com and we'll get them to the right people. So without further ado, we're gonna get started. Um, I would first like to ask one of our guests, um, Siobhan, what are some of the common misconceptions of AI that you have heard uh, from people working with it for the first time? Thanks, Christine. Um, I think one common misperception I hear a lot, especially I've taken a lot of different AI classes here in my time at Stanford and starting out, you know, you think that you can apply any of these tools to your problem and it will work right away. Or, you know, they'll all work for the same problem. And then as you start working with it, you find that tuning parameters is really important or tuning your data set or spending time doing featureization makes a big difference. So I guess one of the main misperceptions I've heard is just that AI will always work from your problem. And I think it's important to recognize that a lot of work goes into making it work um, and it can take a lot of time. But uh, that's sort of the interesting part about working with these tools is finding out why certain ways work and what methods are important and which parameters make a big impact on the performance. Yeah. Really and I like you. that <laughs> yeah, I like that you called it a uh, linear regression because in my experience that always works really well in the first time compared to a lot of other methods. 
Yeah, I like to call it out just because, yeah, like you said, it, it, it's always good to go back to basics and understand where you're coming from first, right? So thank you so much. Um, next, I would like to ask Graham from NREL. Um, you talked a bit about building explainable tools for AI. So my question to you then is, what are some key considerations or questions that you should consider when you're building an explainable AI tool? Awesome. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and thanks for asking. So I think at a high level, there's a few bullets to kind of keep in mind. Um, I think I mentioned some, but when you're thinking about explainable AI and, and you, you want to be able to create a model around that, especially if the model doesn't exist yet, if you're if you're creating a model from the outright, you have kind of a different platform to start as opposed to if you're trying to make a, a model that already exists explainable. So that's definitely something to, to keep in mind there. But for both of those, um, I think for myself, uh, a really key important question is who is being explained to, you know, who is that stakeholder mm -hmm. It's again, really important because they'll have a certain expectation of what is a proper explanation in context. And again, that example is like, if it's the developer themselves or the machine learning modelers, um, the types of explanations that they want or need could be very different from a, a subject matter expert or a decision maker that exists downstream. Um, in conjunction with that, thinking about, you know, what are the reasons for the explanation or what types of explanations are needed? So what questions am I really trying to answer here? What is this explanation going to enable? Um, and at really at what stage of the model development? Is this helping me tune a model, um, you know, debug or steer something that exists? You know, those explanations can help me change things on the fly, um, as opposed to I really want to be able to understand a complex decision that's made at the end. I don't I don't want to, to change the model in any way. And and with that, it's once you kind of answer those those things um, and you have the model in question, obviously, then you can kind of ask, you know, what methods can be used to enable this type of an explanation? You know, are these visual means? Um, are these, you know, ensemble statistics? Do I need to be able to interact with it? Um, a lot of those types of, of questions and methods can then come into play. And, and, and that's where the taxonomy um, that I mentioned kind of comes in of, of binning specific types of questions with specific techniques to kind of enable that that explanation so great thank you i really like that you yeah. brought up the type of audience that you're trying to look at I, i'm personally a very visual person and so for me having a visualization is always really good I and mean, regardless of what the technical topic is right Excellent. yeah likewise yeah thank you so um i'd like to now to direct uh, a question towards uh, and every panelist, and I will pick on critique first. So you had talked a bit about uh, image processing. Uh, I haven't worked with it very much myself. So do I need to be a machine learning or deep learning expert to scope out an image processing project? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question, Christine. So I think um, you, you, as, as a project manager, you know, um, you don't really have to have an in-depth knowledge, I think it's, it's really necessary to have an introduction to, you know, uh, what image processing is and what are the techniques that are generally used so that, you know, you can yourself identify who's selling snake oil versus who, who means the real deal. So once you have that background in, in image processing, I think there's multiple free data sets, free services, free APIs from various various um, providers that allow you to just integrate that into your into your own systems. And so for that, you don't essentially have, necessarily have to be a machine learning engineer. You can, you, can, um, you can just, you know, maybe as a software engineer, try to implement these techniques into your, into your own projects and then scope out the projects. Uh, I, think, I think the best example would be, um, you know, uh, say um, PII removal, where, where you want to detect the faces of the people in, a, in an image or even detect the license plates or some sensitive information. Uh, for that, you don't necessarily need to train your own models. There's a bunch of APIs, thanks to the advancements in deep learning uh, recently, that you can you know readily use off off the internet and then try to integrate that with your projects. Yeah. Excellent. I really appreciate it. That actually does tie it back a bit back into Graham's comment, right? About having AI be explainable. You know, anyone can look at it, right? Whether or not you're a project manager or a technical person. Um, Great, so uh, my next question goes to Yashwant. So when we're dealing with personally identifiable information or critical energy infrastructure in text data, what are some 
techniques or methods that you can use to deal with data that is sensitive? And, and does it work really well? That's a really good question and something uh, it's really important to address that question as well. Um, so it can be dealt in two different ways. Um, one, of, one of the really simple approaches is making this huge exhaustive list of all the things you want the uh, uh, you want the information to be redacted or removed in a data set, and you just write a script that says that hey, go over this in entire data set and get rid of all of the instances of these particular words. Uh, but that gets really messy really quick because spelling mistakes happen, and that's completely human. Um, acronyms happen, and that's completely intentional. So it's it gets really hard to build this exhaustive list. So what's a machine learning way to deal with a machine learning problem? Build a model that feeds as an input, right? So similar to the classification uh, approach that we've talked about earlier in the session, we can build a model that's capable of classifying different personally identifiable information. So this could may include names, uh, phone numbers, component names, which is really important for in the nuclear mm -hmm. industry. Um, it, it gets really important um, uh, because of data governance and all of the all of the data uh, security stuff. So yeah, two simple approaches. One really simple approach. One is a machine learning approach, which is kind of tough to build but really great to execute. Oh, interesting. So, um, actually, before you go, a follow-up question to that. You mentioned that it's it's quite a bit of work to do a lot of this masking for PII or uh, CEII information. I guess a follow-up question to that, and this also came in during the chat, was do you then need to build a big library uh, before you can do an NLP classification type problem? So, the the construction of a library um, can be in one of two ways, right? One could be an exhaustive list of all the PII that one wants to ignore in the entire data set. Um, or if you're talking about building an NLP library that's capable of you know, building AI models and doing machine learning, there's a lot of open source tools out there. Just like Pratik mentioned, uh, there are libraries out there in Python, in R, and a lot of other statistical packages where you can just import libraries for in one line of code and you can get going. But a really important point that I will mention now and we'll probably talk more about it tomorrow is we will have to move to data centric thinking and less about you know specifying libraries and classification algorithms. Um, there are a lot of algorithms that out there that work tremendously well. I mean, that's that's state of the art models for you. But if the data is not curated properly, then the model is more or less a really just a bad model. Even a state of the art model works really bad on a badly curated data set. So it's really important to um, keep this data centric vision in mind when uh, building any sort of model, not just NLP, be it vision models or time series model, I think. Um, we're, we're in the uh, era of big data, right? We've reached that stage where we can confidently say, hey, we have petabytes of data um, on our cloud systems, but is that data good quality? I think that's, that's the question we need to address next. Yeah, really good. So following up with that, talking about data quality, I talked about it a little bit in my presentation, but you know, I also wanted to ask Graham as well, because he talked about bias. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could expand a little bit more, Graham. Um, in your work in energy modeling, what are the, some of the major uh, bias flags that you have looked out for when you're doing your own research? That's a good question, um, and definitely a rabbit hole that we can go down. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think outside of like the normal, like technical limitations, like if we're talking just on the, the data side, not on like the model implicitly, like making sure mm. things are coded properly, et cetera. Um, it's, it's probably this slippery term of confirmation bias to some extent um, where we expect a certain type of outcome 
And we may not see that when we generate a certain type of a model, you know, it's like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why that didn't happen. And sometimes that's because, you know, maybe we were incorrect in assumption and the data is actually telling us, you know, what's really happening. Uh, but other times, you know, maybe that's, there is a piece of that, that, you know, the model could be incorrect. Um, and, and just more of a of going through an iterative piece, you know, it's not usually just one model, like a one and done. And now, yeah, this is exactly what's going to tell me the answer here. It's, you know, taking your data sets, um, I think, expanding a little bit on that cleaning process. You know, that's generally where most of the work is done. Um, you know, garbage in is garbage out. And I, I think, like, if you can spend the time to get quality data and make sure, for example, if, if you're modeling a, a distribution connection with a transmission system and you want to be able to do some predictions or forecasting, you know, that your features that you're getting, if you're looking at, you know, reinforcement learning, for example, to kind of drive these types of systems, that, that you're capturing the right amount of data um, to be able to do those things. And the, the, the fields that are available to you, whether this is synthetic data or not, um, could be biasing outcomes. You know, if, if I'm ignoring a certain variable because some of it's missing um, and I just choose to delete them, for example, as opposed to try to find another method, um, that could easily be biasing the types of actions um, an agent may be taking, for example. So that cleaning process or the, the data, you know, management process and engineering process is definitely where a lot of bias can come into play if we're not careful. Okay, great, thanks so much. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I'd like to bring it back to, to Siobhan. Um, you had mentioned clustering is one of your favorite AI tools, and it's actually one of my favorite as well. Um, I guess then uh, I would wanna ask you, for you, why is it that clustering is one of your favorite AI tools? I'm glad to hear it's one of your favorites too. I think it's so interesting because it, it can find patterns in the data that I wouldn't have seen without using those tools. So a lot of other models look at, if you think of supervised learning, you know, you have a model, you have an understanding of the inputs and outputs, but with clustering, it's just looking for patterns within this data set and often it gives really interesting insights that I think end up being really intuitive, but somehow also surprising. I'm often surprised by the patterns that show up and say, oh, these go together. That makes so much sense. Or, you know, there's these, these are the distinct types of groups that we find. Um, and I think that, I just think it's exciting. Find surprises in the data. Yeah, I like it a lot too. I, I really like how some of these unsupervised methods, I mean, because they are unsupervised, can find I guess, unsupervised answers and things that you wouldn't have normally seen in the first place. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm taking a look at some of the questions. A lot of good questions came in. Again, please email us at ai.epri.com uh, in case your question didn't get answered. Looking through, um, let's see. Okay, so here's a good question, and this might be a general question for the panel if, if, if one person wants to take it. Uh, when using a learning AI model, so this might be more of a reinforcement type question, um, do you have to save or store the user information or feedback in order to achieve the learning effect? someone would like to take that if, one. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab yeah, at that. Go ahead, I'm, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll preface it with I, I'm not a, a deep RL expert by any means. Tomorrow, you're actually gonna see a number of really great examples uh, from a colleague of mine who can probably go into more depth with that for sure. Um, but to, to take a yeah. stab at it for now, depending on your training process, I, I think, again, usually your agent is going to be learning in sort of a gym type setting if you wanna take the analog. And that data is really going in to learn a type of a function. Um, so it's not attached to the model when it comes out. Um, and this thing is then actively able to um, have its own, based on the reward paradigm, based on how you're gonna reward it and what types of actions is gonna take place in the environment, um, it's, it's able to just learn that function. And then when you want to deploy that in the real world, however you give the rewards or however you want that 
that uh, agent to learn in the space is how it's going to actually proceed forward. So the data isn't attached to the, the agent or the model in at least that kind of a context or that setting. Um, now, there are other examples where you could look in like the gaming industry or open AI, mm -hmm. for example, where you are getting lots of environmental feedback from user actions that that agent could be interacting with. And now that data would be saved and stored along with snapshots of this agent so you could go and retrain and, and learn different types of reward functions because that's typically where the the special sauce uh, is going to be for for deep rl or something along those lines does that help i hopefully i think that answers kind of the question but stay tuned tomorrow for some good examples into that as well how the training takes place oh yeah definitely I, i'm glad you mentioned um it's a good setup for tomorrow you always want to yeah. put a little bit there and then set up for tomorrow so um Okay, great. I, I think that finishes our questions now. Thank you very much to the panelists uh, for answering everything. Again, we had a lot of really good questions come in. So uh, send them if they didn't get answered to uh, AI at .com and we'll follow up with you guys. Um, after this, I would like to pass it back to Jeremy. All right, thank you so much, Christine. And a big thank you to all our panelists and speakers. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us as well as those who are uh, participating in the meeting. So just a reminder, same time tomorrow, we'll be having this meeting. We're going to be changing the focus from kind of an introductory training on AI to a look at what's coming in the future and the state of the art today. We'll focus a lot more on use, case, use cases and how we can utilize these advanced tools and technologies that we have at our disposal. So thank you everyone for participating and we will see you tomorrow.